All right, so in chapter number 14, let's dig right in here. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, In the second year of Joash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. So most of this chapter, what we're dealing with is Amaziah and the reign of Amaziah. Amaziah is one of the, the kings of Judah. Judah was the more righteous of the two kingdoms between Israel and Judah. Um, There's a lot more righteous kings. and They tended to follow the Lord a lot more in Judah than in Israel. So Amaziah is the son of Joash, king of Judah. He was 25 years old when he began to reign and reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoaddan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did according to all things as Joash his father did. Now you remember Joash did good all the days of um, Jehoiada, right? So he did good when he had a leader. He did good when he had an example. He did good when someone was kind of telling him what to do. But then as soon as he was gone, then he kind of started doing wickedly. And he did some good things, just like here, Amaziah, overall, his reign and his life is characterized as doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So it's, it's, a, it's obviously that's what you'd want to have said about you. You did that which was right in the sight of the Lord as opposed to doing that which is evil in the sight of the Lord. But he didn't have the heart like David had. Remember, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And he's of the lineage of King David. And that's why it says, yet not like David, his father. So you can do well. You can do right, but still have a lot lacking enough to have God pointing it out and saying, yeah, you know, he did that which is right but not like David did. And so many of these people, what we're seeing is that they're lacking the heart. They're lacking the true desire. Yeah, they may be doing some things that are right. They may be getting through life. They may be doing some things that are good, making some accomplishments, but what's really lacking is their heart to serve God, their heart to meditate on the word of God, to know the law of the Lord and to love it and to really just vehemently pursue God's righteousness and, and righteousness being done in the land and, and really submitting themselves to God and serving God. That's what's lacking for so many of these kings, even the ones that are doing right. Because we see these things mentioned. So he did right, but it was, he's more like his dad, Joash, instead of his dad, David. He should have taken after David a little bit more, but he's not an evil person. Verse number four. Howbeit the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. And I think this, you know, I've mentioned this before, and we're going to see it continue to be, to be stated throughout these chapters of the high places. Yep, the high places are still there. The high places are still there. The high places are still there. Why? Because people are not wanting to follow the whole law. People are not just desirous of doing everything that's right with zeal. Jehu had zeal when it came to fighting. He was a good warrior. He was good at getting Satan out, and we saw that before, but he still did not want to walk perfectly in the law of the Lord. He still did not set his heart to just completely embrace all of God's law. He picked the parts that he wanted to do, and he, did he do good work? Yes, he did. Was he blessed for that? Yes, he was, but he still did not wholly desire to follow the law as was David's desire. And as a result, we continue to have the high places. We continue to have the idols. We continue to have this leftover remnant of, of sin and wickedness just not just completely you know, cleaning house and getting rid of everything. Jehu made, took, got rid of a significant sin that was going on, which is the Baal worship, and getting that out of the land. But he didn't continue on that cause of cleaning things up. See, we may get victories in our life and getting over certain sins in our life, big sins, blaring sins, something that's a major problem. But we got to make sure we don't just stop there and just say, yeah, I got, you know, I conquered that sin and everything's great now. And now I'm just going to chill and just coast. And it may be said you did, you did right in the sight of the Lord. You may accomplish some things, but 
guaranteed if that's the attitude you have, there's still going to be some high places in your life that you're just leaving alone and not touching and not cleansing up to, to just get everything out, get all of the wickedness out, purge all of the leaven out of your life. Let's keep reading here. That's a repetitive theme. We're going to see that over and over again. Verse number five, and it came to pass as soon as the kingdom was confirmed in his hand that he slew his servants, which had slain the king, his father. So if you remember, um, Jehoash was murdered by his own servants. They conspired against, no. He had started to do wickedly after um, Jehoiada died. And you remember he, he sought out Elisha and... Um, you know, they still beat back Syria, but um, I'm trying to see where it was in the last chapter. But any, anyhow, it doesn't matter. He was killed. He was murdered by his own servants. And um, now his son Amaziah is setting things right. He found the murders because that's how he ascended to the throne. But he's saying, you know, these servants are still wicked for, put, for killing the king. Obviously, that's not something they should have done. So it says in verse six, in verse five, it says he had them put to death, right? He caught them, he put them to death. In verse six, it says, but the children of the murderers, he slew not. Now there's examples in the Bible. You'll see people just kill, you know, like killing the offenders and just wiping out everyone in their family. And that's actually not righteous. Now, there are times when God has pronounced for the children of Israel to wipe out a land like when they went into the promised land and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the, you know, basically the Canaanites, that they were supposed to be completely annihilated. And that was God's will. And that, and that God's judgment was coming down upon those nations. But when it comes to the law, see, that was, God, that, that was, kind of like, that was like a one-time thing of God clearing out those people. But when it comes to the, the established law of God and how, we, how things are supposed to be dealt with in a civil society and they're in, in Israel and the nation of Israel was if, if, if someone commits a crime worthy of death, you only punish that person. You don't, you don't carry out the sentence against the whole family. So whether it be a son or a father, you know, whoever was the one guilty of committing that sin, they paid for their sin. And this is a concept, if you want to keep your finger here, you, you will see this. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 24, what, what he's referencing there. I'll read the rest of this book, this, this verse here in, chapter, in verse 6. It says, But the children of the murderers he slew not, according unto that which is written in the book of the law of Moses, wherein the Lord commanded, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, nor the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Deuteronomy 24, 16 says, The fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. I mean, it's a verbatim quote. But that's where it's found. That aspect of the law is found in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this concept because it's very important. It's important that we understand that we are only held responsible for our own actions. You know, God's not going to hold you responsible for someone else's actions. You are guilt. If you've committed a law, or commit a law, commit a crime, if you've broken God's law, then you get punished for that. The punishment goes to you. You are responsible. But there's a teaching out there, and it's, it stems from this Calvinistic teaching and also a Catholic teaching of original sin. And that, the, the concept or the doctrine of original sin goes against, is contrary to this concept in God's law, saying that, you know, the father shall not be put to death for the children, neither the children put to death for the, father, for the sins of their fathers. What original sin teaches, and what, I'm, what I am against with this, and this is, in the Calvinist world, you know, they believe in the five points of Calvinism, and they use an acronym, they use the word TULIP to describe what their, what their beliefs are. So each letter refers to an, one, another aspect of their doctrine. So the T is total depravity. The U is, um, 
um, what is the U? The L is limited atonement. The I is uh, irresistible grace. The P is perseverance of the saints. The U is, um, well, my brain's going like, it doesn't matter because we're going to deal with T, total depravity, okay? It's going to come to me in a minute, but um, total depravity relies on this concept of original sin. So when someone is considered totally depraved, what they're saying is that when you're unsaved, everyone who's unsaved, before you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are completely depraved and devoid of, or capable of doing anything, and you're automatically hellbound. Um, obviously, you're hellbound without Jesus Christ. We believe that too. But they'll even go as far as to say is that you, can't, you don't even have the will or the power to put your faith in Jesus Christ, that God has to give that to you. And this is, this is one of the aspects of Calvinism that's just it's completely wicked and false. All of them are, oh, unconditional grace. That's what the U is. I told you it was going to come to you. Unconditional grace, right? Where God just picks and chooses who's going to get saved. But that's what all of Calvinism is about. But the total depravity is saying that you're completely, totally depraved. And, and um, it goes back to this concept that comes from Adam. So... In Romans 5, we're going to read the passage here. Now, we do have, there are repercussions that have gone forth to future generations as a result of Adam's sin. However, we are not judged by God off of Adam's sin. There's a huge difference there. If Adam can be considered our father physically because he was the first man that, that was responsible, you know, Adam and Eve were ultimately the human instrument is responsible for every single person who's alive on this earth today. So we go back to this, you know, and you want to talk about the sins of our father would be when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and they didn't even have this whole law. They had one law. They said, hey, in this garden you could eat whatever you want. Freely eat whatever. There's no restrictions or rules except there's this one tree over here. There's one tree in the whole garden. Can't eat off that tree. That's it. Sounds like a pretty simple life. <laughs> They're married. Hey, do whatever you want. Eat whatever you want. You know, enjoy your, your creation. Enjoy this garden. It's all kept for you. You don't have to do any work. Just don't eat from that tree. And what happened? They ate from that tree, of course, you know the story. And as a result of that sin, they both were judged. They both were cursed. They both died in that day spiritually. Because that's what God said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That was his command. That's what he said. You break this command and you're going to die. And they did die. They died spiritually. And then, of course, we see later that, there, that God covers them with, with uh, skins of an animal. So there was, a, there was a blood sacrifice made to atone for them and, to, and that picture of Jesus Christ. Of course, I'm not going to get into all that. So the concept, though, that I'm, that I'm preaching against is this concept that original sin. And see, this is why Catholics will baptize infants. It's because of this reason. They think that because Adam sinned, that we are automatically sinners immediately. And his sin is passed down to us. And if you die, you know, they say without being baptized, right, then you're going to end up in purgatory or hell. That's the Catholic teaching. And it's just totally false. Look at Romans chapter 5. Now, we do receive a sinful nature. Because of that sin that brought death into the world and we are, we are naturally now prone to sinning. That's something that did change that we inherited from Adam. He didn't start off with that. They had free will. They didn't have that, that, that tendency, I don't believe, to just sin like we do today. However, having, having a sinful nature still does not make you automatically sin. We still have the choice and we're still responsible for our actions. So every step along the way, even though we have a sinful nature, doesn't mean that, well, we're just, you're just automatically going to sin. No, it's up to you. 
Every sin that you've ever done in your life was your choice. You decided to do that. And the sins that you choose to do, you're responsible for. God is not going to send anyone to hell because of Adam's sin. Not going to happen. Romans chapter 5, look at verse number 12. We're going we're to look at this and what the New Testament has to say about this. Verse number 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. See, before that sin even happened, there wasn't sin in the world. But it came by one man. There wasn't sin just rampant in this world. There was, there was no sin until the very first sin. He said, but by man, sin entered in the world and death by sin. There was no death. There was no need for death until there was sin. And because there's sin, sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. Death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, not because Adam sinned, for that all have sinned. See, death passed upon all men because all have sinned. Then, you know, it's not just because of Adam. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So basically what this is saying is that the law has always been around God's law, you know, right and wrong. But you can't punish somebody for breaking a law. It can't be imputed when there is no law, when the law hasn't been given, when it hasn't been told, when it hasn't been written, right? How can you hold someone responsible for something they don't even know? If you don't know something's a law, it's not a law. But see, you can't take, you know, God has given us his law. It's up to you to read it. It's up to you to know it. It's, up to, it's your obligation, responsibility to, to, to get a hold of it and learn it. He's already given it. So you can't say, oh, I have never heard the Bible. Well, the Bible's around and it's available. And that becomes our obligation, our responsibility. Kind of like, you know, when you, you know, even in, in this state, we're, we're obligated to know what the laws are. It's just, it's just incumbent upon you to know that. And using ignorance is not an excuse. Now, ignorance is an excuse when the law was never given to begin with. You can't just make something up and just be like, well, that's the law. And you're just automatically guilty. Well, I didn't even know. But, and that's, so that's what this is saying. Let's just keep reading here. I don't want to get too bogged down with that. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. So he's saying, even though you know, the law wasn't given because Moses gave the law, right? Death still reigned between Adam and Moses. People were still dying. Why? Because they still had sin. And they didn't sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression, so they didn't eat of the forbidden fruit because they were cast out of the garden. No one else could even do that. But they had other sins. There was other things that they did that was still against God's law. And now, you know, we don't have a record of everything necessarily that God told people because God was communicating way back in, in days of Adam and Eve. And so, I mean, he was literally like communicating with the people audibly. And I believe that, they, you know, before there was anything even written down, all the stories that we have through Genesis come from Moses writing them down. And, not, and you know, they're true. They happen. It's the word of God. But there was the, the means of, of transmitting God's word and telling people what to do was a little bit different because he was able to just tell them. There wasn't that many people, and it wasn't until later that, that until Moses when everything was just established in writing. So they were still obviously capable of sinning. They knew they weren't supposed to kill like Cain and Abel. You know, that, that was something they knew not to murder. That was something that God had, had told them that was wrong. You know, they, they, they had known that was wrong. Even though I can't point you to a verse where God said not to murder to them, by God holding them responsible and giving a punishment unto Cain, we know that he had to have told them because God doesn't, you know, it, because of what we're reading right here. The law is not imputed when there is no law. Well, God had told them. It just wasn't written down yet. Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if... Through the offense of one, many be dead, 
much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one the condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So you notice the going back and forth between Adam and his sin and Jesus Christ and what he did. And because of one man, sin entered into the world. Because of Adam's transgression, death reigned. Because he brought sin into the world, now people have a sinful nature and other people start to sin and the sin grows and grows and grows like leaven, right? And it spreads. So just as it was one man that really brought that sin into the world, what, he's, what the Bible says here is that likewise, by one man, all of sin can be covered. All of sin can be forgiven because of the righteousness of the one man can destroy the effects that was brought in by Adam. Now let's keep reading here. Verse number 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Now, verses 18 and 19, they sum up the entire thought here, and it's, it's crucial to understand the way that judgment came on all men is the same way that righteousness came to all men. So, if we were literally going to be held responsible for Adam's sin, okay, if you were to read this and say, well, yeah, because of Adam, that's why I'm damned to hell as a sinner because of what Adam did. If you take that thought process, then you'd have to apply it equally in this passage to say, well, because Jesus died for everybody, then everybody is automatically saved and have that free gift. You see what I'm saying? So like, if everyone's automatically damned because of Adam, then everyone would automatically be saved because of Jesus. But that's not the case. And I don't know anyone that believes that. That it's just everyone's automatically just, just saved because what Jesus did, whether you believe in him or not, whether, you know, just completely unconditionally, Jesus paid for everyone, so everyone's going to heaven. Well, the reason why that's, you know, for the same reason that that's not true, well, Adam's sin is not just imputed unto all of us because he did wrong. All that we received from him as a result of that was having a sinful nature, to have the propensity to, to kind of want to sin, but it's still our own actions just as much. It's our, it's our, it's our own choices that, that drive us to sin. It's our own choices that drive us to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. It all boils down to what we choose to do, what we do with our own will. The free will that God has given us, he's given us that choice. We choose to believe just as much as we choose to sin. Adam had a choice to obey or disobey. Just because he chose to disobey does not mean, well, now no one has a choice. No, everybody does after him. Everyone has the same free will to choose. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see the punishment for Adam's sin. Adam's sin does not send every other person to hell. And that is ultimately, though, people may mean different things when they talk about original sin. So the definition that I was using is what I'm preaching against. Some people, don't, don't freak out if someone uses the term original sin. They may just be referring to the fact that we have a sinful nature. So if they want to, you know, whatever, it, 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 use whatever terms you want, but just, just for the sake of being clear with people, though, understand what they're saying, because if it's that Catholic type of a meaning, completely false, right? And, and think about how twisted that is, too. That would mean that, like, even stillbirths and, and babies that die in the womb, hey, they couldn't even be baptized. Don't they have Adam's sin on them? And wouldn't they then go to, to purgatory or hell or whatever? You know, like, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. 
And God is not like that. God is a righteous judge. Where there is no law, someone, a, a, a person being born, you know, being developed in the womb doesn't know right from wrong. Just like infants don't, just like little babies don't, they don't know, they don't have a law because they don't, they don't even understand words yet. They don't even understand concepts, you know, barely. So it's, you can't hold them responsible for, for sin. And God doesn't, and that's clear, and that's, that's kind of a whole other sermon in and of itself. But what kind of God would just send babies straight to hell to be burned and tortured forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? He wouldn't do that. Because they don't have sin, because they are pure. The Apostle Paul said, I was alive once without the law. But when the law came, sin revived and I died. So, meaning that we're all alive once without the law. When we're little, before we understand right from wrong, before we understand that there's a law, before we understand that, hey, God said not to do this, before we know anything even about that, we're alive. Spiritually, we're alive. Just as Adam was spiritually alive in the garden until the day that he disobeyed God and sinned and his spirit died. And then needed to be born again. Needed that birth. Let's keep reading here, 2 Kings. Go back to 2 Kings 14. And actually, 2 Kings 14, we're also going to be looking at 2 Chronicles 25. You know, we've been doing this a lot, kind of looking at the parallel passages in Chronicles. So we're going to get some more insight into these stories that, that, we've been, that we're reading about in uh, 2 Kings. So 2 Kings 14, look at verse number 7. The Bible reads, He slew of Edom in the valley of salt 10,000 and took Selah by war and called the name of it Jokthiel unto this day. So, you know, in the previous chapter, verses, he put to death the people that conspired against his father, put his father to death, but didn't, you know, he stopped there. He didn't put their children to death or anything like that because their children were, were blameless. And then he goes into the land of Edom and he kills 10,000 people. Now that sounds pretty impressive. I mean, 10,000 people, right? It's a big number. And he takes Selah by war and called the name of it Jokthiel unto this day. So, so he's gone and, and, bat and made this, this battle and he's killed 10,000 people. And it sounds pretty impressive. But, and, then, and he ends up getting lifted up. Amaziah gets lifted up with some pride as a result of this victory in this war. But turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 25. Because after these major victories, he's feeling very confident. Killing 10,000 definitely sounds impressive. However, he did have an army of 300,000 men. And we don't get that in 2 Kings 14, but we do get that in 2 Chronicles 25. It explains that he had, you know, with, 300, with an army of 300,000 men, you ought to be able to kill 10,000, right? So, it just, I mean, just even without God being involved in, in say, you know, in like fighting your battles for you or things like that, you know, just, just in human warfare without any, any divine intervention or, or involvement, 300,000 army, yeah, you, you know, it does, it's, it's makes sense to kill 10,000 people in, in a battle that they would fight in those days. So uh, we get more on this info on this story and how he fights with Israel. Because if you remember, we read this whole chapter at the beginning of the service and um, we see Amaziah. Now he fought and defeated Edom. And, he, and he's conquested, and he's got a, a city here. He's taken over city. But he also then turns to fight with Israel. And that's, that's not a good choice that he makes. But look at verse number 5 of Second Chronicles 25. The Bible reads, Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to, to war that could handle spear and shield. And then look at verse 6. It says, He hired also an 100,000 mighty men of valor out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. So not only does he have 300,000 men, but then he also goes to hire 100,000 out of Israel. Verse number seven, but there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not 
the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel, to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. So now he gets a message from God. See, remember, Amaziah was, is, is um, we're told that he did that which is right in the sight of the Lord. He cared about what God said. He, he did, you know, go to God for counsel. And, um, you know, he wasn't an evil person. So now he gets this message saying, hey, you know, you've got 300,000 men. Don't hire the children of Israel because they're wicked. You don't need them. And look, this is something that we need to understand too. If you feel like you don't have enough resources to get any job done or whatever you need to do, you don't need to go to the world and not just the world. If you go to the world for things you need to get done, that's fine as far as, you know, hiring some help to do some work for you or whatever. Obviously, we're going to be hiring people, but we don't need to go to wicked people to team up with us to join us in a fight. We're not going to go get you know, a bunch of sodomites to help us out and to do some work for God or do some other great work. You know, leave them alone. We, we don't want them to have anything to do with us. So people who are really wicked, which is the Bible saying here that, you know, Israel is wicked at this time. He's saying, don't, don't allow them to come and help you. They were fighting and the, the first battle was righteous. God was giving them these vic this victory over Edom. And he's saying, you are good to go by yourself. You don't need any help from anyone else. You don't need especially wicked Israel to go with you. He says, uh, verse 8, But if thou wilt go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy, for God hath power to help and to cast down. So basically what, he, you know, what the man of God is saying to Amaziah is saying, you know what? It ultimately, it's not going to matter how many people you have because God is capable to either make you stand or make you fall. And what God wants you to do right now is to listen to him. Obey him. Don't bring these wicked people of Israel in to help you because you don't need them. First of all, God could just use what you have to get the job done. But second of all, if you, if you feel more confident, because think about that, an extra 100,000 people I mean, that's, that's a third of what he already had. That's an extra 33% increase to his forces. You think, oh man, now we're really strong, right? 100,000 people, that's nothing to God. God says, you choose to do that and you rely on them, you rely on these wicked people instead of relying on me, just remember God's able to, bring, to, to lift you up and to bring you back down. God can make you fall. And we need to remember that in our own lives that we don't get tempted by going to wicked people to give us some kind of peace of mind or, you know, because we're troubled about something in our life. That we just go to some, to some wicked influence, some, you know. God can lift you up. Go to him. And God can also bring you down. You know, it could be business dealings. It can be all kinds of different things. It could just be managing I mean, even something as simple as just managing your, your health or your pain or whatever, like you can go to a really wicked source to try to get comfort instead of going to a righteous source. You know, I mean, you could turn to booze, you could turn to just, you know, hard drugs and whatever, or you could, you know, rely on God. And God's saying, look, I could help you with this or I could bring you down and I could bring you low. Um, there's many applications to that. So just keep that in mind. And this is what he's saying to Amaziah. So verse 9, he says, And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for the hundred talents which I have given to the army of Israel? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. So again, another lesson to be learned. He's already hired these people. He's already given a lot of money to hire these servants. And then he finds out and then he realizes, oh, I shouldn't have done that because it's not right. This is wrong. You know, maybe you've just uh, locked yourself into a contract to have a bunch of Hollywood movies pumped into your home, right? Maybe you just spent a bunch of money and now you feel like, well, now I'm kind of committed to this. 
And then you find out, you know what? It's wickedness. It's wrong. You shouldn't set any wicked thing before your eyes. And you go, oh, man, but what am I going to do? I mean, I just spent all this money. I can't just waste it. And he says, you know what? Don't worry about the stinking money. Don't worry about that. The hunter tells you that God can do that and so much more for you. Just listen to God. God's looking at your heart. God's looking to see if you're going to do the right thing and not worry about the financial cost or the financial burden or what am I going to lose as a result of listening to God. Don't worry about any of it. Don't worry about the money you might lose by following God. Don't worry about the family or friends you might lose by following God. God can give you so much more. Just do what God says. That's what he's getting across here. Amazon, I mean, if you think about it, wow, 100 talents. I mean, we don't know exactly how much a talent is, but it's a lot of money. It's a sig very significant. I mean, it's enough to hire 100,000 people to go to war. So just think about how much it would cost to hire one person to go off and fight in a war. I don't know what our U.S. military pays people, but that's essentially what they're doing. They get paid. They receive a paycheck. They get benefits and everything else to go off and fight in a war. How much does it cost for 100,000 soldiers to go off and fight in a war? I don't know, but it's a lot of money. And God's saying, cut your losses. And that's what we need to do in our life. We need to cut our losses. When you find out you're doing something that's wrong, I don't care how much you've invested into it. It doesn't matter. When you, when you realize something's wrong and God's saying not to do something that you're doing, you need to be able to cut your losses and just say, well, that's a learning experience. Well, I'm just going to do what right by God and just, it is what it is. What, whatever the circumstance is. And that's what Amaziah ended up doing. I think this is one of the reasons why he's considered someone who did right in the sight of the Lord. Because he listened to God. And this was a big deal. It's a big step to take to say, okay, well, we don't need you. Verse number 10 says, Then Amaziah separated them to wit the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again. So these people, he hired them and they already showed up. So now he's got to say, you know, and, and look, this is another reminder too, because it's embarrassing to stand up in front of everyone now and say, oh, well, I don't really need you. You need to go home. Which is also why it's important to know beforehand what the right thing is to do so you don't get yourself into these sticky situations where you're losing a whole bunch of money and you have to be embarrassed and ashamed to say, oh yeah, sorry, you know, I goofed up. I, you know, I, I really don't, don't need you guys anyways. Go ahead and go home. Because this also ended up causing problems. Now, thank God for doing the right thing. That he did the right thing. And, and that, that is, if you make that, you know, mess of yourself, then just wherever you're at, you realize, no, this is what's right, then do what's right from that point forward. And God will help you out. But as a result of him having to do this now, verse 10, it says, um, it says, the army that was come to him out of Ephraim to go home again, wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. So we get more, we're going to get more context here, because in 2 Kings 14, Amaziah just, it looks like he just decides to go to war with Israel. That he's just beat Edom, and now he's just choosing to go to war with Israel. But there's a little bit more to it than that. We're getting the backstory here. So as these people are leaving, look at verse number 13 in 2 Chronicles 25. It says, But the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even unto Beth Horon and smote 3,000 of them and took much spoil. So as a result of him then, you know, listening to God and sending those people away, they ended up getting really angry about it and then attacking some of the cities of Judah and spoiling them and killing a bunch of people, you know, before going back. So it's not that... Um, There was absolutely zero reason for Amaziah to want to fight with Israel. That looks like a pretty decent reason to me. You know, I mean, he atta they attacked him. And it's a natural response then to want to go off and fight them and fight them in a battle and fight them in a war, especially after, you know, they just finished this battle with Edom and they conquered them and they defeated them. Now feeling up and lifted up. Hey, we're, now we're going to take these guys on because they did this to us. When what he should have done 
was to take his losses because he never should have hired him to begin with. It was his own fault for hiring him. Now, obviously, they shouldn't have done what they did either. But he needed to be able to just completely cut his losses and then not go to war with Israel, especially without consulting with God first. Because that's what they were supposed to be doing in every battle and every war that they would be fighting is God. Like, I mean, that's what David did, right? If he had the heart of David, David is always going, God, are we going to do this? God, will you deliver us? God, how should we do this? God, if I go here, are these people going to deliver me up to Saul or are they going to you know, protect me? And God would direct his path the whole way and, and do everything that, that, you know. And in some cases, he'd say, yep, go to battle. I'm delivering them in your hand. And in other times, he'd say, no, wait or go here and do this. And that's why David was so successful. And see, that's what these kings, when they don't follow like David did, get themselves into extra messes and extra problems. Let's keep reading in 2 Chronicles 25. Look at verse 14. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, after that Amaziah was come from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the children of Seir and set them up to be his gods and bowed down himself before them and burned incense unto them. Again, another king... He said, he did right in the sight of the Lord. Don't forget that. But, I mean, he got really low. This is like Solomon. He goes into another land. He brings them back and he sets them up to be his gods. Verse 15, wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah. And he sent unto him a prophet which said unto him, why hast thou sought after the gods of the people which could not deliver their own people out of thine hand? He said, how stupid are you? You just got... This prophecy, this prophet of, the, of a man of God, a man of the Lord, telling you, hey, don't bring these, the children of Israel. They're wicked. I'll deliver them into your hand. Don't worry about them. You don't need it. And he had the faith to do it and to send them back. And then he goes and he gets this victory. And while he's there, he sees these, these idols. And for whatever reason, just thinks, oh, wow, look at these this must be a real God or whatever and, and brings them home and worship them. And God sent the prophet is like, why would you trust in some stupid God they, that couldn't even deliver their own people? You went in there and destroyed them and they were worshiping that God. That God couldn't help them. That God couldn't deliver them. And now you're going to go and take that God to be your God? Oh, fool. Verse 16, and it came to pass as he talked with him, that the king said unto him, Art thou made of the king's counsel? Forbear. Why shouldest thou be smitten? And so what he's basically saying is, shut up. Shut up. He said, are you one of my counselors? No? Then shut up. That's his response to the prophet. Then the prophet forbear, meaning he stopped talking and said, I know that God hath determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my counsel. Foolish. He listened the first time to the council and did that which was right. And then he, he's, he's trying to receive, you know, get corrected again. God's trying to correct him and he refuses it. And we need to make sure that we're very careful because you could be doing the right thing one day and making great sacrifices and, and, and saying, all right, this is wicked. It's done. I'm just going to do what's right. I'm going to step out by faith. And you could have great victories. And watch out, take heed lest you fall, because this isn't just Amaziah that, that's capable of falling like this, of then getting into sin, and then once you get in that sin, you become stiff-necked and stubborn and rebellious, and you don't want to hear anything from God. No, I'm going to set up my idol now, and I just, I'm just going to do this. And then destruction comes. And that's what happened with Amaziah. He got lifted up in pride. Then he wanted to go and conquer the world, right? He wanted to go and conquer Israel because they, they offended him. They killed 3,000 of his men. They, they were, you know, um, spoiling some of his cities because he sent them back. And then he goes to fight with them. Go back, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 14.
2 Kings 14, verse number 8 says, Then Amaziah sent messengers unto Jehoiada. So, and what I'm doing, by the way, when, I, when we go to these, this passage in like 2 Chronicles, I'm keeping it in chronological order of where we're at in the story in 2 Kings. So the events that are taking place there all fit. And you could go back and read it later and see for yourself, but I'm just, we're only reading certain sections where we get extra information, but it's completely in the timeline of events that we're going through in 2 Kings 14. So just so you don't get confused with that. Verse number eight says, Then Amaziah sent messengers to Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us look one another in the face. Now, there's a few times in the Bible that it uses terminology like this that isn't necessarily part of our regular vocabulary. So you might be a little bit confused about what this means. Basically, what he's saying, let us look one another in the face, is just another term used to fight a battle. We're going to fight. We're going we're gonna to have basically a war. Let us look one another in the face. Now, I'm going to read this for you, but in 2 Samuel chapter 2 and in chapter number 10, there's also phrases that are similar to this used. So when um, Joab and um, Abner, way back in the early days with David, um, when David was just, had just taken over, Joab and Abner were fighting each other, and they used similar phrases. I'll just read this for you in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible reads, And Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. So you've got these two generals of these armies, right? You've got Joab and you've got Abner. And when they say, Let the men play before us, it's not talking about like playing Twister. Okay, <laughs> they're talking about fighting. It's just another term, another phrase that's used that's not very common today, but he's saying, let them play before us. And, and then it says they're going to play the men. So why? Because they're strategizing and they're the ones sending their men off to battle. So whether it be let us look one another in the face or uh, play before us. And then in verse 17, it says, and there was a very sore battle that day in, uh, in 2 Samuel 2. So just, just showing, you know, it's kind of proving that it was a battle. It wasn't, they weren't playing, you know, footsies or, or Jenga or something. They were, they were, you know, battling. It was a battle. And um, it wasn't a dance battle either. It was a very sore battle. They weren't break dancing. Verse number 11, and he, uh, or excuse me, Second Samuel 10, basically the same thing. And he said, if the Syrians be too strong for me, then thou shalt help me. But if the children of Ammon be too strong for thee, then I will come and help thee. And um, this was a, a battle that was going on. Verse 12 said, Be of good courage and let us play the men for our people and for the cities of our God and the Lord. Do that which seemeth him good. So I just wanted to bring this up because there's a few places like this where you might be scratching your head a little bit like, what is he talking about there? Playing the men. But, you know, in the context, it's pretty obvious he's talking about it's just other language being used for fighting. And it's the same thing here. Let us look one another in the face. Now, one thing about this, looking one another in the face, is how men used to do war and used to fight and used to battle. You'd be looking your, your enemy in the face and fighting with them, as opposed to today doing, you know, some guy sitting with a joystick doing drone strikes and killing thousands of people and not looking their enemies in the face and just doing things blindly or sniping or whatever. I don't think that's the way that war should be fought. I mean, war is a, a bloody deal. It's a, it's a very um, big event. It's a, it's, a, it's a big deal to have to face. And when you start completely removing people from even seeing the ramifications of their actions by like being able to just press buttons, you completely lose the, the weight and the gravity of war itself. When people get too used to peace or, you know, never experienced anything like that, they're a lot easier to get sucked into saying, oh yeah, let's fight them, let's send off people to go to war. War's, a, war's not a good thing. I mean, there's, there's, there's just wars where, you, where you're defending yourself from aggression, from evil people. But it's not something that we should just be flippantly getting involved in. I mean, there's a reason why there's such a high suicide rate of the United States veterans coming back from our current wars because our wars are unjust and they're, they're seeing and doing things that are just completely horrible and horrendous in these wars overseas. 
and there is no point to them other than greed. It's a bottom line. It's greed. You're being sold a bunch of lies on the tell lie vision, telling you all kinds of different reasons, oh, why we're over there, why we need to be there, why we need to bring them democracy and free their country. And it's a bunch of baloney. It's a bunch of garbage. Let's keep reading here in 2 Kings chapter 14. They looked one another in the face when they fought. Verse number 9. And Jehoash, the king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, king of Judah, saying, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And there passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon and trod down the thistle. The thistle is just like some real small like bramble bush or whatever, like a, a small plant. And obviously a cedar is a really big tree. So he's saying, look, he's giving this analogy, right? The thistle saying to the cedar, hey, give me your daughter for my son to marry, right? As if you have any place to go and demand something like that, being a thistle to a cedar. And then he says, some wild beast just comes along and just tramples on the thistle and it's just gone. Like, like the cedar doesn't even have to deal with you because some wild beast can just come along and destroy you. That's how little and insignificant you are. This is the analogy that the king of Israel is giving to Amaziah. Verse 10, thou hast indeed smitten Edom and thine heart hath lifted thee up. Glory of this and tarry at home. For why shouldest thou meddle to thy hurt that thou shouldest fall and even thou and Judah with thee? So he's saying, look, you, made, you had this great victory over Edom. Just celebrate and enjoy that victory and stay home. And don't get involved in our business. Don't, don't think that you're going to come and, and battle us because we're not Edom. Enjoy your victory. That's great. But, but don't get involved and mess with us. And, he, and he's saying, because he, look, Israel's not trying to get in a war with Judah. And that's why he's giving them this message saying, don't mess with us. Stay home. Don't come out and fight because it's not going to go the same way that it went with Edom with you. It says in verse 11, but Amaziah would not hear. He was stiff-necked, just like he wouldn't listen to the man of God when he got the idolatry from the Edomites. Wouldn't listen. Therefore, Jehoash, king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, king of Judah, looked one another in the face at Beth Shemesh, which belongeth to Judah. And uh, I'll just read this for you from 2 Chronicles 25, verse 20. The Bible says, But Amaziah would not hear, for it came of God, that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought after the gods of Edom. Notice, he wouldn't hear the king of Israel saying not to fight him, because it came from God, because God now was looking to bring Amaziah down. God hardened his heart to not hear Israel, not hear the king of Israel, and just ignore it. But that came after God had already tried to get through to him and sent his messenger. God didn't harden his heart when he sent his messenger. Amaziah had his own choice to do that. Now, I'm not saying Amaziah was a reprobate, but I'm saying that because God's able to, to lift up and to bring down, which is what he does with, with kings, and he did that with Amaziah. He's able to bring up, to, to lift up and to bring down. He brought Amaziah down, and he was going to make sure that Amaziah now is going down because he chose to have those stinking idols and refused to listen to what God had to say. So now... He's not even going to let them hear anymore. He's saying, nope, now you're going to be punished. Now you're going to be judged. You brought this on yourself, Amaziah. And he truly did. Proverbs 26, 17, you have to turn there, says, He that passeth by and meddleth with strife not belonging to him, or belonging not to him, is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. And again, this is what Amaziah was doing. Look, this isn't your fight, Amaziah. You should have just left it alone. But instead, it's like you're taking a dog by the ears, which is going to snap and chew your arm off if you try to do that. So don't try to do that. Don't grab dogs by their ears. Not even our dogs. Okay? They get really angry. So back in 2 Kings chapter 14, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And Judah was put to the worst before Israel, and they fled every man to their tents. And Jehoash king of Israel took Amaziah king of Judah, the son of Jehoash, the son of Ahaziah, 
at Beth Shemesh and came to Jerusalem and break down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim unto the corner gate, 400 cubits. And he took all the gold and silver and all the vessels that were found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and hostages and returned to Samaria. Now, how humiliating. I mean, not only was he defeated, but he was defeated by a wicked people. God already said that they're wicked, but God never said to go and attack them. God said, look, I don't want them fighting with you because they're wicked and I want you guys to be righteous. I want you to just trust in me. Don't worry about what they're doing. You do what's right. But instead, he decided to turn against them and now it turned on him. And they are wicked. Look at what they ended up doing. They ended up, you know, not only defeating them in battle, but then they go and break down their walls. They go and steal their gold and silver. They go and take hostages, essentially of their brethren, because that is still their brethren, you know, the people of Judah, and then, then bring them back to Samaria and just, just completely destroy them. Verse 15, now the rest of the acts of Jehoash, which he did in his might, and how he fought with Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Jehoash slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria with the king the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam, his son, reigned in his stead. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, 15 years. And the rest of the acts of Amaziah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Now they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish, but they sent after him to Lachish and slew him there. So now Amaziah, just like his father was killed, so was he killed. His own servants conspired against him and killed him. And if you remember kind of near the beginning of the chapter, it says he did that which was right of the Lord, but not as David's father did, but as his father did. So he basically followed the same path of his father. He did right for a while, and then he decided to just disobey God and get caught up in idolatry. And now his fate ended up to be the same as his father's fate, that his own people turned on him and killed him. Verse 20, And they brought him on horses, and he was buried at Jerusalem with his fathers in the city of David. And all the people of Judah took Azariah, which was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Elath and restored it to Judah. After that, the king slept with his fathers. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. So now this Jeroboam was another uh, son of Jehu. He's the third descendant of Jehu that's sitting on the, on the throne. And just like the others, I brought this up, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, he did that which is evil and didn't depart from the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Verse number 25, he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath Hefer. And this is really interesting. This is the only reference that we have to this that Jonah prophesied this is Jonah from the book of Jonah, the Jonah, the son of Amittai. And he apparently had prophesied that Israel was going to restore their coasts back to where they were originally given because the, the entering in of Hamath under the Sea of the Plain was the land they were originally given before they, start, you know, before they turned from the Lord and people started invading them and they started losing land. So he restored that land back. Now, that, this prophecy is not found in the book of Jonah in any of the four chapters because that book is all about Nineveh and has nothing to do with, with this specifically. But this is here for a reason. I don't know um, any more uh, information on why, but it, this, is, this is really interesting. It's something that stands out as to you know, this being added in here because Jonah isn't even, besides Jesus Christ referencing him about his own um, death and resurrection, He's not really talked about anywhere else, so this is kind of this is this is in here for a reason. So um, look into that a little bit more. But uh, let's keep reading. Verse number twenty-six: For the Lord saw the affliction of Israel, that it was very bitter. For there was not any shut up, nor any left, nor any helper for Israel. And the Lord said not that He would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, but He saved them by the hand of Jeroboam the son of Joash. So this is also kind of interesting to note: is that. The Bible already said that Jeroboam 
did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He was not a righteous king. But God still used him to sustain Israel. And because, and the reason why he brings this up is that I'm not going to blot out their name. Why? Because he still had to fulfill promises. He can't go back on his word. So even though Jeroboam is wicked and he's doing evil things, God's still allowing him to, um, to win battles and to sustain Israel because he was not going to completely blot them out. Um, verse number 28, Now the rest of the acts of Jeroboam and all that he did in his might, how he warred and how he recovered Damascus and Hamath, which belonged to Judah for Israel, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Jeroboam slept with his fathers, even with the kings of Israel, and Zechariah his son reigned in his stead. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I pray that you would please help us to learn uh, the important lessons that we need to learn that we need to take away. God, I pray that you please stir up our hearts, help us to serve you utterly and completely, dear Lord, that we would um, get victory over sins in our life and, and not just stop or sit back with one, but help us to, to follow you wholeheartedly. Pray that you would please just um, watch over us, protect us, or God, help us to grow and to reach more people uh, um, with, the, with the gospel. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.